Well, hey guys, in today's video, we're gonna be talking about the problem with SPF, sun protection factor. But before we do that, give this video a thumbs up if you like hearing about sunscreen from a board certified dermatologist. Be sure you're subscribed and you have your bell notifications on, that way YouTube lets you know as soon as my videos go live. SPF stands for sun protection factor, and it basically conveys to the consumer the protection that a given sunscreen product affords against a sunburn. Now, if you weren't aware, there are a few different things that come from the sun that can affect our skin. UVB is primarily what is responsible for a sunburn, but you also have UVA, which penetrates really deeply, largely plays a role in tanning, although the two, UVB and UVA, they do overlap to a certain extent in terms of the impact they have on our skin. You also have infrared radiation, which leads to the sensation of heat that likewise can impact your skin, and you have visible light. SPF, or sun protection factor, is the best known reference worldwide for expressing UVB protection. But it's not perfect, and we're gonna get into the limitations in today's video. SPF testing, importantly, is carried out on actual human people, on actual human volunteers. SPF testing is carried out by measuring something called the minimal erythemal dose on actual human people. So it's an in vivo test, meaning on people, on human volunteers. And the way it's done is basically to determine the uh, dose of ultraviolet radiation with and without sunscreen required to begin to achieve barely perceptible redness, light pink redness, the first signs of a sunburn essentially. And so SPF represents the ratio with and without sunscreen. So the higher the SPF, the more uh, UVB protective a sunscreen is in comparison to no sunscreen. And SPF testing is done by applying sunscreen in a density of two milligrams per centimeter square. But in reality, in real world use, most people apply about half of that. So that by itself is one limitation of the current methodology is that it doesn't really reflect real world application practices density, how people apply sunscreen in the real world. Most people are not consciously applying that much to their skin. They apply a much thinner layer. As a result, the final sunscreen protection that they get is much lower than what was tested. But there are more issues with SPF testing beyond just this problem with sunscreen density. You also have variability from lab to lab. No lab is going to reproduce a value 100% equivalent to another lab. But for sunscreen manufacturers, they only need to use one lab. And so there can be some variability from lab to lab in terms of how perhaps machines are calibrated. And there also can be variability from sunscreen product batch to batch. So the batch that is used in the testing, the batch that you end up purchasing and using, there may be a slight difference that ultimately could influence how that SPF is different from what was tested. SPF testing is done indoors and factors like heat and humidity also can influence the final outcome. Now, one thing that always crosses my mind when I'm reading ingredients on sunscreens is how exactly is it that the inactive ingredients in a sunscreen formulation may influence the SPF measurements? For example, many inactive ingredients in sunscreens are anti-inflammatory and anti-redness. And, you know, that's great and everything, but how does that end up influencing the uh, subjective measurement of redness. For example, if you are using a sunscreen that has niacinamide in it, um, how does that niacinamide end up influencing the SPF testing? Is it minimizing the redness, but not necessarily minimizing sun damage? Niacinamide is not a UV uh, blocking, absorbing ingredient, but it can minimize redness. So do ingredients that are anti-inflammatory like niacinamide or certain antioxidants, um, visible all, for example, is anti-inflammatory. Do these inactive ingredients that have no sun protective abilities, they're not UV blocking or absorbing, how are these influencing the minimal erythematous dose readings, which are a subjective reading of barely perceptible redness in the skin? Are they minimizing redness a bit and therefore skewing the data in terms of reading of that, of that MED? When they do SPF testing, they don't include a vehicle control. A vehicle control would be the sunscreen product minus the sunscreen ingredients. So you would, in that situation, see if there's any impact from the inactive ingredients in terms of minimizing redness and how that might impact things. But that is not done 
in standard uh, SPF testing. I'm not saying that you should abandon the sunscreens that have these anti-inflammatory ingredients, but in my mind, I do question to what extent they influence the, um, the outcome of redness. I already kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, MED testing, that, that barely perceptible redness, the erythema that they're looking for, that is a subjective measurement. And there can be person-to-person -person variations in terms of what one reader may call as barely perceptible erythema, and another reader may not you know, be noticing anything. So there can be some differences there that are going to really be very difficult to control for. Because this test relies on the erythemal response as a biologic endpoint, there's also the issue of the fact that different skin types and ethnicities have different erythemal responses to UV rays. SPF testing is very time intensive as well. Just to do SPF testing, the redness is red anywhere from 16 to 24 hours after the uh, volunteer is irradiated. So you have that window of time, but if you're going to take it a step further and do water resistance testing, well, you're gonna to have to repeat that with the water resistance testing where the individual is you know, submerged in a whirlpool and then you have to repeat the SPF testing. So it becomes very time intensive and it is expensive, very expensive, which can be actually cost prohibitive for smaller brands in particular. Uh, it can cost anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 to do SPF testing. Because of how time intensive and cost intensive it is, this poses a challenge to sunscreen developers in the development stage of sunscreen formulation design. They can't really invest in testing smaller batches early on and tweaking the formulas. Importantly, we have serious ethical considerations when it comes to SPF testing. This is done on actual humans. You have to expose humans to a carcinogen to do this. UV rays are carcinogenic. We know this. We know they are responsible for skin cancer. We know they cause DNA damage. The whole point of SPF testing is to be done on a product huh, that's going to protect consumers from those damaging UV rays. But in, in testing for the protection, we have to basically expose volunteers, human volunteers, to, to a carcinogen. The other issue with SPF testing is that it's conducted in a controlled indoor environment using a solar simulator as the light source. That solar simulator is fundamentally very different in terms of the UV spectrum from the sun. So it's not like the sun at all. The solar simulator used in SPF testing is designed to simulate UVB rays. But remember, the sun has UVA, it has infrared radiation, and there's visible light. UVB is actually only a small fraction of what we get from the sun in terms of exposures. For regulatory and reporting purposes, an SPF value is only needed from one laboratory. I mean, you can imagine this would be too time and cost intensive to try out your sunscreen at a bunch of different laboratories. And for that reason, you can get uh, quite a bit actually of variation from one lab to another. One study actually showed that uh, three different labs resulted in a 20% variation in the SPF, and in some cases up to a 50% variation. So for this reason, you know, when you see those reports, like the consumer, re consumer reports uh, report that comes out, and they're always like, oh my God, you know, most sunscreens are lying or whatever, they're not lying. It's lab to lab variation in the SPF testing. And because Consumer Reports does their own thing um, and we don't know that they're following the uh, protocols and things, it, you know, to rely on what Consumer Reports tested themselves, I always discourage people from falling for that. As a matter of fact, I have an older video on why I don't look to Consumer Reports to determine sunscreen efficacy because of this reason, you know, and, and I go into more detail in that video. So I'll link it down below if you're curious about that. But you'll recall back to the Purito debacle too, and this sort of same thing came up. Of course, there were some other issues that were going on there, which we learned about from Odile Manad, which I'll link her video down below if you're at all interested in how the Korean uh, sunscreen ingredient issue became a thing. So yeah, I'll link her video down below because she's much more informed about the different regulatory um, mechanisms in Korea and Korean skincare. I alluded to this earlier, but you have issues with inclusion 
you're not capturing all skin types and ethnicities in this test. All of these issues taken together, there's also the regulatory oversight issue. How is it possible for the regulatory bodies that be to go in and fact check all of our sunscreens. It's a very laborious, costly, time intensive test. And again, the ethics of exposing people to a carcinogen for the purpose of this test, it's not going to be possible for like the FDA here in the US or other regulatory bodies in different countries to go in and fact check everyone's SPF testing. And the fact that it is costly, time intensive, and you know, the ethical issue of exposing people to a carcinogen, this really impedes uh, sunscreen innovation, development, product design. All that to say, I think we need alternatives to the in vivo test, the test on actual human people. The ethics and the time and the cost and the reproducibility issues. So there are some non-human tests that uh, researchers have been working on for a long time. They're not perfect, they have their issues, but they've actually really been working hard at this. And I think it's definitely time to revisit how we test for SPF and move away from using actual human people to something that can be done in the lab or even on a computer, reliable, reproducible, without the risk of exposing humans to a carcinogen, less costly, and um, and uh, less time, you know, much much more quickly. So the in vitro test would involve applying sunscreen to an artificial substance, and there, in and of itself, has been a huge hurdle. My understanding is because you have the issue of reproducing human skin. Human skin is not like a flat piece of plastic, like a plastic dish. It's a 3D structure. You've got grooves, crevices uh, that you need to cover, not to mention getting a substrate that reproduces the adherence of the product onto human skin. It's very technically very challenging. There can be a lot of inconsistencies with spreading, um, how, the, how the sunscreen is spread on on the substrate, on the, on the say dish, for example. Slight differences in application pressure actually can influence distribution of the sunscreen ingredients onto the substrate, ultimately influencing the results. And I learned this today, that actually can also happen with the human tests. Like there can be differences in how it, the pressure of how that individual spreads it on the skin that actually can impact the final results. Just like the in vivo test, you will run into the issue of reproducibility. I mean, you're gonna have operator differences, lab differences with a test like this. But most importantly, a, a in vitro test, it has to correlate with the gold standard in vivo test. So they have to get it to basically be equivalent to what we're using now in order for it to be considered. There's also an in silico test, basically means on a computer, a computer model that takes into account sunscreen ingredients, inactive ingredients, formulation overall, the relative instabilities of different sunscreen active ingredients, and basically creates a um, creates an SPF from that. It's able to is able to do that through computer modeling. The computer method is not subject to human error, and it is proving to be very reproducible. So that may be an alternative in the future. So in a 2007 proposed rule and a 2011 update, the FDA said it was not gonna consider in vitro tests as alternatives to the current gold standard in vivo test, meaning on actual human skin. But they did acknowledge that if equivalence could be demonstrated, that in the future they would consider an in vitro test. So I would love it if you know that could be reconsidered because I do think significant advances have been made to the in vitro methods that would allow for basically uh, less expensive testing, more ethical, we're not exposing people to UV rays, uh, more reproducible, meaning less lab to lab variation, uh, faster, smarter, seems like a better alternative to what we're doing currently. And all that to say, um, you know, pointing out the limitations of sun protective factor SPF testing, uh, does that mean you should just bail on sunscreen that it's not reliable, like all these limitations, why do we even bother, right? Um, no, take a step back. Of course, the SPF testing is not perfect. There are a lot of issues with it. 
But when you look at the literature, overall epidemiologic studies, we have good evidence to show that using sunscreen can help in protecting against the development of skin cancers, as well as reducing premature skin aging. And it also is very helpful, necessary for a variety of sun sensitive skin conditions like rosacea and melasma. And we have good evidence for those conditions that using a broad spectrum sunscreen is very, very helpful in controlling disease flares and symptoms. So regardless of the limitations of SPF testing, wearing a broad spectrum sunscreen to sun exposed areas is a recommendation and you shouldn't feel as though it is futile because the research shows that it is very helpful despite these issues with how we go about determining the SPF. In addition to wearing a broad spectrum sunscreen to protect your skin from the sun, don't just rely on sunscreen alone. Um, you also should be wearing sun protective clothing when you're gonna be spending time outdoors, being mindful of your time outdoors, uh, protecting your eyes with sunglasses, reapplying your sunscreen. So those are the imperfections with SPF testing and why we need a better test. Um, no test is ever gonna be perfect. No, no test is going to be 100% uh, without error, but we certainly can advance and we have uh, my understanding from reading the uh, Literature is that there have been a lot of advances in these in vitro tests that could potentially replace our unethical SPF testing I hope this video was helpful to you guys and that you enjoyed it If so give it a thumbs up share it with your friends and as always don't forget sunscreen and subscribe I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye